Welcome to part one of our lecture on schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. In this lecture, we will focus on positive, negative, and disorganized symptoms of psychosis. These are the th three broad categories of psychotic symptoms that are seen across a variety of psychotic disorders and other conditions such as mood congruent psychosis, sometimes also seen in bipolar one disorder. Psychotic disorders are characterized by delusions, hallucinations, disorganized thinking and speech, grossly disorganized behavior, abnormal motor behavior, and or negative symptoms. So while many have heard of schizophrenia, there are actually a variety of other disorders that share these symptoms to a greater or lesser degree. For example, there's delusional disorder, schizoaffective disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. We're gonna talk about the quick definition of each of the th categories of behaviors or symptoms, and then we're gonna go into each in greater depth. The positive symptoms are an excess or a distortion of normal functioning. So if we set a bar and we think about that bar being what normal functioning is, this would be the addition of things that are abnormal. So seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that are not there. The negative symptoms, think about that normal bar and now you're dropping down one. So something is being taken away and it's now creating something abnormal. And the disorganized symptoms are disorganized speech, behavior, or the way people show emotion. And we're gonna talk about them each in depth. Positive symptoms are the active manifestations of abnormal behavior um, or an excess or distortion of normal behavior. So whereas somebody may be able to hear, this would be the addition of hearing things that other people don't hear, hearing things that aren't really there. They're broken into two broad categories, the hallucinations and the delusions. For hallucinations, these are experiences that appear to be genuine perceptions, but they're happening without an external stimuli, and they can occur through any of the five senses. What's important to note is these are not under the individual's control. They are as vivid and real and clear to the individual as normal perceptual experiences and that they occur across a number of different disorders, not only the psychotic disorders. For example, you may remember we talked about hypnagogic hallucinations in the sleep disorders, that these are hallucinations people have as they are in the process of going to sleep. Hallucinations can happen through any of the five senses. So visual hallucinations, these are seeing things that aren't there. Um, like seeing a cat walking down the street when there is no cat there. These are different from illusions. Illusions are misrepresentation of actual stimulus. So if you think about driving along the street on a hot day, you look down the street and you, it looks like there's heat rising off the street. Well, that is something that's really happening, but you misperceived it as water. Or if you think you saw somebody standing nearby, but then when you turn and look and you see that it was a shadow from a tree branch, that would be an illusion. There was real stimuli there that drew your attention and for a moment you misperceived what you saw, but then upon looking again, you were able to tell what it actually was. But for a visual hallucination, they're actually seeing things that aren't there and there is no stimuli in the environment that would have led them to accidentally perceive that. So it's important to make sure that we're differentiating. Is there something that led the person to see that, think that, believe that, um, or are they kind of conjuring that on their own? So visual hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there, olfactory, smelling things that aren't actually there. And this is actually quite rare, but this may be smelling apple pie without there being food around. Gustatory, tasting things that aren't, aren't actually there. Now, this to stay with our analogy, this would be tasting an apple pie without having, having eaten anything. Again, this is very, very rare. And then tactile hallucinations, feeling things that aren't there. Again, very rare, but this may be feeling bugs crawling on their skin without there being bugs there. 
the most common hallucination is an auditory hallucination, hearing things that aren't actually there. Some common examples, hearing voices talking, giving a running commentary on one's behavior. What's interesting about auditory hallucinations is to think about where are these coming from and how is this happening? It's a pretty fascinating phenomenon. Turns out Broca's area is active during auditory hallucinations and Wernicke's area is not activated. So why is this important? Broca's area is the part of the brain that is actually producing speech producing language. And Wernicke's is the part of the brain that is trying to process and interpret what other people are saying to us. So if Broca's is activated and Wernicke's is not activated, then it can't be that they're hearing external voices and then trying to interpret them. Instead, they are hearing their own thoughts, they're generating their own thoughts, they're generating the noises and things that they're hearing, but they're somehow misperceiving that it's something external to them. So they are hearing thoughts, they're hearing their own thoughts in their own voices, but they don't recognize them as their own. To give you an idea of what this might be like, I'm going to show you a video of Anderson Cooper, who is doing a schizophrenia simulator. And he's gonna show a couple of minutes of him trying to do different activities while he has these, the earplugs in his ears that are simulating what it would be like to engage in these behaviors if you had auditory hallucinations. Now I'm going to be asked a series of questions by uh, our producer Susan, um, and these are basically a series of questions that a person would be asked in if they were being admitted to a hospital. Can you tell me what day it is? Uh, yeah, it's um, Sunday, um, June. Uh, I don't know, what's the day? Seven. So I'm going to say five numbers, and I want you to repeat them back to me after I'm done. Okay. Five, twenty-three, sixty-seven. Two seventy-six. Five twenty-three sixty-seven. Something seventy-six. I'm gonna say five words. Um, you don't have to repeat them, but just listen to them. Cat, book, cigar, damage, and rain. Make you okay. Can you name the last four presidents of the United States? Okay. Barack Obama, George Bush. Um, here. Right here. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, and George Bush. Here. Here. So those five words I said before, can you remember any of them? Yeah. It's hard when, because sometimes voices are like whispering, uh, and sometimes they're aggressive, and sometimes they're kind of comforting. And again, when people are kind of talking to you all the time, it's, it's okay. It's hard. Don't worry. Now we're so I'm going to try to make a boat. Well, or me following these instructions. Okay. Okay. Shut up! Shut I want to talk back to the voices now, but it's really, it's really distracting. So. Do not touch that stuff! You stop! This is easy. You want to touch that? I can do that. Hand down. Put your eyes down. Just do it. Do it. Do it. Don't be mine. Leave it alone. It's also frustrating because they're telling me I can't do it. And uh, so I didn't do a very good job with the boat. Um, but it just, it's really hard to, it's hard to focus when kind of people are whispering to you and, and talking to you. Just come clear. Come here to me. Come here for help. Hey, do you have, uh, do you have yesterday's paper? Yesterday's New York Times? No? Okay, I'll just get started. 
it's really it's incredibly distracting on the street to have somebody talking in your head and, and it makes you feel completely isolated from everyone else around you. You don't want to engage in conversation with other people. You kind of find yourself wanting to engage in conversation with a voice in your head because they're constantly being really negative and talking to you and, and everything they're saying relates to things that you're actually doing. They're criticizing things you're doing. It's like every somebody's it's like you have a chorus watching you and commenting on what you're doing and you ha can't help it. I mean, I literally find myself wanting to kind of respond to them, kind of tell them to be quiet, and it's uh, it's incredibly unpleasant. This is a very, very unpleasant experiment. Um, it's really, uh, I mean, it's eye-opening because it kind of really shows you what it's, what other people must be going through who, who deal with this on a regular basis. Um, but also, like, I cannot wait to take these headphones off because it's, uh, it's really depressing. It's very, uh, it's very negative. It makes you feel very, very negative. Um, yeah, it's, it's very creepy. I want to stop. Ask Tom, back up, stand up now. I'll count you off. Ask Tom, 20, 30, 40, stand up now. Walk away. You're okay. Walk now. Yes. I don't know how you felt, but it was incredibly hard to even watch Anderson Cooper go through that simulation and to imagine trying to think, do math computations, follow simple directions, have a simple conversation with another person with that going on in the background. It's very, very disconcerting. If you get an opportunity to do such a simulation, I highly encourage that you give it a try because it can be eye-opening and trying to understand life as somebody who may have psychosis. The second broad category of positive symptoms are delusions. These refer to distorted thoughts and beliefs that people may hold, and they will hold them despite conflicting evidence that would say that those beliefs are not true. Once again, we see delusions in a variety of disorders. For example, we've talked about somatic delusions regarding health and functioning when we talked about some of the somatic disorders, and we also talked about delusions during manic episodes. It can be difficult to distinguish between a delusion and a very strongly held idea. And part of what we consider is how strongly they are holding that conviction despite clear or reasonable contradictory evidence regarding its veracity. So if people continue to believe something despite there being clear evidence that it is incorrect or that it is impossible to happen, but they choose to continue believing that, and they hold that belief very strongly, they're unwavering, that's the point where we might begin to consider that it's a delusion rather than simply a strongly held idea. We're gonna talk about the different types of delusions, but while I'm doing that, I want you to think about, are there circumstances where you could imagine delusions actually being helpful or being even adaptive, improving function? The primary types of delusions are, one, delusions of persecution. This is by far the most common form of delusion. And here, individuals believe that others are out to get them, hurt them, harm them, harass them. An example, somebody may be, believe that the FBI is following her, or he may feel persecuted when a coworker calls in sick, believing that this is part of a conspiracy to make him or her miserable that day by increasing their workload. Another form is delu delusions of grandeur. Here, the individual believes that they are an extremely important or famous person, like believing that they are the president, um, believing that they can end world starvation, and then delusions of reference. And this one is actually fairly common as well. Here, people believe that certain gestures, comments, book passages, newspapers, etc., are a specific reference directed at them in particular. And again, we've talked about these in other examples. For example, when you talked about 
people with mania that included psychosis. So here it could be someone who thinks that every time the professor clicks the top of their pen and makes that noise, that it is a special, special message telling them that they are supposed to do something in particular or that they are getting a special message about the upcoming exam. So going back to our earlier question about whether or not delusions can be adaptive, I would argue that they actually can be quite adaptive. If you think about someone who is having the kind of tortured experience that we mentioned or in the simulator, a delusion could actually give them a sense of purpose and a meaning in life. For example, we could argue that if I had a delusion that I was a very special and powerful person, that that could actually buffer me from some of the negative beliefs that one might develop if they've been struggling. And as support for this, we know that some of these delusions actually are associated with lower rates of depression. So it can decrease depression if they hold some of these kinds of delusions. So maybe delusions can be helpful. It might be a bit harder to make an argument that delusions are adaptive or helpful when we talk about this next set of delusions. Here we're talking about the bizarre delusions. These are delusions that are clearly implausible. They, they are not understood by same culture peers. They're not derived from ordinary life experiences. These delusions defy often the, the basic physical laws and properties as we come to understand them. So common examples, thought withdrawal. Here individual believe that their thoughts are being taken away from them by some outside force, like an alien is stealing their thoughts and making their mind go blank. Now what's important here is they are actually believing that their thoughts are a tangible thing and that something from outside of them has gone into their head, grabbed that tangible thought and plucked it out of their head and taken it away. The reverse of that, thought insertion, the belief that others, that thoughts are being inserted into their head, that some alien or some other person is putting their thought into their head. Now, this is not merely a belief that I'm being manipulated or that I'm being convinced of something or that somebody led me to think about something that I wouldn't have thought about had they not done it. Like if you watch a, a commercial for certain food and now you want to go get that food, it's not that kind of thought insertion. Again, they will believe that their thought is like, like a little pebble and somebody opened up their head put that pebble inside of their head and then walked away. So thought withdrawal, thought insertion. Delusions of control. Here they're having the delusion that parts of their bodies are being manipulated by someone else or some other thing. I like to think about this as a, a puppet on strings, that there's some other person, alien, object that is physically controlling whether or not they are lifting their arm or putting their arm down, or if they were to rub their, their head or scratch their head, that they are not in control of doing those actions, that it's actually another entity that's moving them around as if they were a puppet on strings. Capgras syndrome. Here they believe that someone has been replaced by a double. So you would think that I'm your professor, but you realize that your real professor was replaced and now I'm just someone who looks and sounds and acts like her, but isn't really her. And Cotard syndrome. Here they have the belief that their body has been changed or a part of their body has been changed in some completely impossible way, like believing half of their brain has been melted or that their blood is actually molten lava running through their body, or that their arm has turned into stone. The next category of symptoms are the disorganized symptoms. Here you see disorganized, erratic, or inappropriate 
speech, behavior, or affect. And again, affect being how we show our emotion. So let's talk first about types of disorganized speech. And our disorganized speech reflects disorganized thinking. So we can often have a gauge into how someone is thinking by how they're able to organize their, their speaking. So one example would be tangentiality. Here, imagine that the person is answering unrelated, their answers to a question is, seems to be unrelated, like it's tangential. I mean, the example I'll give is, if I asked, what is your mother's maiden name? Most of us would have a pretty quick answer, one word answer, but imagine instead someone says, oh, my mother was a great woman and an even better mother. We have a large family in Southern Michigan. The city has three grocery stores. There's the country market, the Piggly Wiggly. Oh, oh my best friend had a big farm. Old McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. So there you see that they were answering questions. They were answering the question perhaps, but then they kept kind of just following this trail of things that were linked to the last thing they said, but they never really came about, came around to giving you the answer that you expected. Another example is uh, derailment or loose associations. So here they're changing to a completely unrelated topic. So again, the same question, what is your mother's maiden name? But this time they, the person answers with, I really love my cat. Oh, but my foot really hurts. Oh, I hope MSU wins the title this year. I'm really tired of swimming in the summer. So note, this is different from tangentiality where the conversation at least has some relationship to the question that was asked. With loose association, there is no real relationship. What they're saying doesn't follow what was asked, but even the segments within their sentences don't follow from one another. And our third example is word salad. And this is just completely incoherent speech. The words just appear to be thrown together, even if the sound of it mimics sentence structure, the words themselves are just jumbled. So again, what is your mother's maiden name? Me, I bug to bat ball, Myra, of you two butt. So you can see in that example, the person responded, but there was no connection to what was asked. And even the segments of the sentence itself did not connect to one another, but then even beyond that, the words that were thrown in seemed random and did not make any sense as a sentence structure. Moving on to grossly disorganized or abnormal motor behavior. The grossly disorganized or abnormal motor behavior shows up in a variety of ways, ranging from kind of having a very childlike silliness that's inappropriate for the person's age to unpredictable agitation. So some examples are catatonia. Here you see a marked decrease in reactivity to the environment. And this happens in a number of different ways. For example, negativism. This would be an extreme resistance to instructions that were given. Catatonic mutism, a complete lack of any verbal response whatsoever. Catatonic stupor, a complete lack of motor response, as if they are lacking awareness of any of their surroundings. So you might put the radio next to them or put a song next to them pump it to full blast, and they will not respond as if they're hearing it at all. Catatonic rigidity. Here, the individual has almost frozen in time, maintaining a posture with resistance if you try to get them to move around. So if you try to move them, it's really, really difficult. And then there's catatonic posturing. So here, they hold inappropriate or really bizarre postures. And this can be very rigid in that 
that, that bizarre posture, or it could be with waxy flexibility where they're going to hold their limbs in that position, but you can go and move them and they will then move themselves or stay in that position that you've now moved them into. And then catatonic excitement, purposeless, unstimulated, excessive motor activity. So you might be pacing around back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, just doing the same behavior over and over and over and doing this for hours and hours on end. I'm gonna quickly move to showing you a video of catatonic posturing with waxy flexibility. Looking at that video, it is quite chilling to imagine what it would be like to be in your body and be stuck. And not only be stuck, but then other people can come and just move you to whatever position they want you in, and then you will stay frozen in that position as well. And notice that he even began to tilt over in one of the positions and was an, unable to stop himself from doing so. And the other person had to grab him and kind of change his positioning so that he didn't fall. It's quite possible that he would have fallen face first and maintained that position despite having just fallen. Some other types of disorganized symptoms, repeated stereotyped movements, staring, grimacing, copying speech or copying movement, Copying speech is echolalia, so this always makes me think of um, the annoying little brother or sister who goes around copying everything you say, like, stop looking at me, stop looking at me. Don't do that, don't do that. And echoproxy, if they just kind of kept going around and following and doing every movement that you're doing. We also look at poor hygiene, for example, wearing a, a down coat, when it's 90 degrees outside, hasn't showered for three months, hasn't washed their hands in three weeks, there might be inappropriate sexual behavior like masturbating in public, unpredictable or untriggered agitation, for example, suddenly shouting or swearing at strangers. And I want to take a moment here to also emphasize this fact that even though these things can be very frightening, it is exceedingly rare for someone with, with schizophrenia to violently act aggressively towards someone else, especially a random person who's not doing anything to them. So even though these can be frightening to look at, it can seem as if the person is going to come and do harm to someone, that is very, very rare. What's actually far more common is that people with schizophrenia are victimized both by people they know and by strangers at a much, much higher rate, which, as you might imagine, can complicate their condition by adding post-traumatic stress on top of schizophrenia or psychotic disorder. In addition to unpredictable or untriggered agitation, there's also disorganized affect. Again, affect being the way we express and show our emotion. So we might see something very sad and start smiling instead of looking sad. Somebody might tell us something really tragic and we begin laughing hysterically. Um, I might randomly start crying for no reason that anybody around me is, is recognizing. Uh, and again, one of the things that's really interesting about this is there's indication that they don't feel emotion any less there's some disconnect between what they are feeling and how their body is expressing what they're feeling. So you might feel very sad with the bad news that you just received, but they start laughing instead of crying, even though they feel the sadness that would go along with crying. Now for the negative symptoms. Remember that the, these symptoms demonstrate a deficit in or an absence of normal behaviors, such as emotionally withdrawing, um, having a lack of, having this empathy, sorry, a lack of 
empathy or an apathy, so not seeming to have any care or concern about anything anymore, a lack of motivation, a poverty of thought or speech, so not able to generate many words or, or say much. These are all very common in schizophrenia, but they're not terribly common in the other psychotic disorders. These symptoms actually explain a significant portion of the comorbidity between schizophrenia and other types of disorders. Um, the negative symptoms, you can imagine if you saw negative symptoms without disorganized symptoms and without uh, any positive symptoms, this would look like somebody who is probably experiencing a major depressive episode. Another interesting fact about the negative symptoms is that they actually do a better job in predicting how severe schizophrenia will be, a much better job than the positive symptoms, because these are social and cognitive declines that have far-reaching and permanent challenges for the individual. And also, the negative symptoms, when people have them, these seem to persist. So they will have negative symptoms throughout the course of, say, schizophrenia, and then when the more active symptoms, those disorganized or uh, positive symptoms, once those go away, they tend to still have the negative symptoms for the rest of their life as well. These first two that we'll talk about are the most obvious in schizophrenia. So a diminished emotional expression, reduced emotional expressions in the face, in eye contact, intonation, uh, and their hand, head, and face movements that would support the emotional content of the speech are now dulled or flattened. Affective flattening. This is also referred to often as a flat affect. So here we see there's a diminished range of emotional expression. About two, -third of, two thirds of those with schizophrenia will have a lack of facial expressions poor eye contact, and little body language to work on. They'll often have a monotone voice. For example, they win the lottery, they don't smile, they hear their mother just died, they're not crying. But again, I wanna emphasize, this is a deficit in the expression of their emotion. It's not a deficit in the feeling of emotion. Research shows that they feel the entire range of emotions, but they just can't express them. Avolition, this translates into without will. Here we see an inability to initiate and persist in normal activities. So there's a lack of interest in doing even some of the most basic behaviors for some, such as bathing. They might sit for hours at a time, showing no interest in work or social activities. Elogia, a relative absence of speech itself. Often when they reply, it's brief, empty replies, maybe one word answers. What you're seeing here is there's a decrease in the fluency and the productivity of speech, meaning how much they can communicate and how smoothly they can communicate. So they're answering questions with a one word response, they rarely initiate speech, and they may respond very, very slowly. Anhedonia is exactly the same as it is when we've talked about it in depression, but here they no longer experience pleasure or interest in activities that they normally enjoy. Like, and this can be social interactions, eating, taking care of themselves. And this can include, a diff include difficulty remembering how enjoyable they found those activities in the past. Asociality is a lack of interest in social interactions and lack of goal-driven behavior. So no longer pursuing school, their job, unable to kind of find that interest to move forward. This brings us to an end of our discussion of the psychotic symptoms, both positive, negative, and disorganized symptoms that are common in psychosis. We will be drawing upon these definitions and examples for our entire lecture on the particular types of psychotic disorders. The symptoms themselves are exactly the same. Which symptoms people have does change based on the disorder. So I'll see you for part two on schizophrenia.